Well, welcome back everybody, ladies and gentlemen. This is the part two of the seminar we did uh, starting yesterday. And today we are going to look at um, scientifically how we should look at the world the way it is. But before we start, let me just uh, say a few words on uh, the word coherence. Because the, the whole principle about what I'm going to present today is based on coherence. More precisely, what I call quantum coherence. Now, the word quantum has been used, or shall we say hijacked, <laughs> into metaphysics. Um, but it, it is correctly hijacked because the whole theory of uh, hologram and the world as it is uh, follows the principle of hologram. And hologram can only exist if there are standing waves. And standing waves is the fundamental thing in quantum physics, uh, straight even from the atoms and electrons orbiting around the nucleus, they follow standing wave patterns. And thanks to uh, the great French uh, prince scientist de Broglie, who actually first ever um, announced matter as waves. It was the intelligence, or if you like, common sense or shrewdness of Einstein who spotted that he could be right. And it was he who actually um, gave him the doctorate uh, uh, in philosophy for that particular discovery of showing matter as waves. It was then preceded, taken further by Erwin Schrodinger, who then formed the equation of the matter, which is now quite popularly known as Schrodinger's equation. And it is with that equation we have cell phones today, the TVs, and all the electronic gadgets we see today, computers, everything, it is based on that equation. And it is interesting to understand and also see De Broglie's view, Schrodinger's view. Then after Schrodinger came David Bohm, what he did with that equation, and then how it led him to believe that the universe was a, a great phantasm or a hologram or a splendid hologram. And after that, believe it or not, it died his own death. And here, for the first time, I'm making that point where it died alive again to carry on further to explain you that what David Bohm did and envisioned was correct. And the world, the universe is a hologram. That is the way it is. It will not change. And I hopefully will be able to show you uh, more precisely how it is a hologram. Now, presently, if we just look at us ourselves as human beings, we have not been living and acting as coherent beings. And what I mean by coherent being, beings means in harmony with others around us and with nature. Instead, we have collectively become out of tune with everybody. And since all things are intellect, our dissonance, which is opposite of resonance, affects all life. Coherence, I believe, is fundamental to the evolution of the universe. Coherence in nature, whether expressed at the level of quantum, of our own mind and body, or of entire biosphere, is more than ordinary form of coherence. It is what I call, as I said earlier, quantum coherence. An instant and enduring interconnection over all space and time. Through the holographic connection of non-local quantum hologram, the universe becomes coherent whole of all its parts. In other words, it is the whole world. Now, the term non-local quantum hologram will become quite obvious to you uh, later on. But just for now, the words non-local quantum hologram should be remembered as Kundalini, so that you know how the circle will be complete towards the end of the, the lecture. Non-local because consciousness is non-local, is everywhere. Quantum because awareness is quantum, is quantized. How is it quantized? We just 
a little based on that yesterday that there is a fundamental and then there's an octave and that's how it's quantized into octave of its own. Now the web of life as we see when we go out and look at the trees, the, the bacteria, the animals, the birds it exists in this form of quantum coherence. Even bacteria process the energy of the sun through the quantum coherence. It is thanks to this that they can transform solar energy with sufficient efficiency to have launched and now sustain the processes of evolution on the planet. Without quantum coherence already at this minuscule level, life could not have started on earth. Life could also not have evolved without quantum coherence of living organisms, be they single, call, single cell creatures, highly evolved mammals or any species in between. Our own consciousness and awareness too is coherent. I remember what I said just now. Our own consciousness and awareness too are coherent. We are also an integral part of the cosmic communication network of this non-local quantum hologram. Our mission is to evolve ourselves and our world beyond anything that has been yet achieved. This is because the coherence of a human being is particularly powerful and empowering. It is not unconscious as the coherence of a quantum in an atom or a molecule. It is not purely instinctive as coherence of other higher species. The coherence of a human being is or can be conscious. So the coherence of a human being is conscious. It can intentionally be directed and empowered. Intentionally directed. This coherence, it connects to the gap we were talking yesterday. This is very important. In atoms and everything, yes, there is coherence, standing waves and everything, but none of them are conscious. Human being is the only one that is conscious and it can, he can direct his intention. And in doing so the right way, by synchronizing what I call awareness and consciousness, you will be empowered. That is what cosmic law is saying. So, having said all that, let's come to the views of the greatest scientists so far. Now I met, uh, the last one I met last month was uh, Roger Penrose. Now he said um, in one of the um, magazines, um, I forgot the name of it, it's called uh, Discover, Discover Magazine. And that's where he's saying, uh, and it's, inter oops, it's interesting to see what he's actually saying. Um, he's saying physicists will never come to grips with the grand theories of universe Penrose holds until they see past the blinding distractions of today's half-baked theories in the deepest layer of reality in which we live. The key sentence is the deepest layer of reality in which we live. What is that deepest layer of reality? And today we will see that it is what we call the Kundalini. That is the deepest layer. You cannot go beyond that. And that is what we're going to go through. And apparently, being a scientist, Roger Penrose is not aware of Kundalini. He, uh, he just doesn't have that insight at the moment. But I'm sure he will because he is trying to understand consciousness. And hopefully one day he will see it through. Let's look at um, the, what Irving Schrodinger has to say. He had a lifelong interest in Vedanta philosophy of Hinduism, which influenced his speculation at the close of what is life. That is the book he wrote about possibility that individual consciousness only manifestation of a unitary consciousness pervading the universe. In other words, he was of the opinion consciousness only exists as a singular thing, not as plural. But he couldn't figure out how the plurality of the consciousness, how come we have so many observers, he couldn't figure that out. If he knew 
the Kundalini was a mirror, then he would have figured it out. Why there are so many observers? But consciousness is one. Let's take an example. For instance, I am standing here in front of you, audience. Right? There'd be 100 people who could be watching me. But I, it's only one of me. But in your minds, there are 100 of me. How can that be possible? How can that be possible? How can 100 images in your 100 individual minds converge into one real person here? That is what we're going to learn today. How can 100 observers see the same thing, yet from different angles, but still one? It converges to one image, real image, yet the virtual images are 100, each one for each person. And that is the perspective I want to explain today. How can that be possible? And that will give you a true insight into how to perceive the universe.